Welcome back, fellow Phobies and Jurors, to another Phobies gameplay video. Uh, today's video is going to be all about analyzing games in Some of All Fears, so 3K plus ELO, and showing you guys how the games go about, essentially, how they're played and kind of the mindset you have to have in order to play uh, higher ranking games. So, um, hopefully I'll assist you on your climb to Mount Avigo. Uh, oh, look, the season restarted. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully, I'll see you guys up on the top leaderboard soon after you watch this video. But, yeah. Let's go find a game to analyze here. Uh, which one looks interesting? I might as well go for the most recent ones against Lost Dream. Okay. Let me pause the video real quick. So, we're on a small map. We're going first. How do we go about this? So, the first thing you want to look for when you start a game is where the panic points are positioned. These panic points, which you can reach in one round, moving your Razor Claw, for example, one, two. Those are two actions in one round, So, meaning you can reach this panic point in one round. That's your pocket point. Same thing goes for this point right here. This is the enemy's pocket point because he can reach it in one round and it his and it is on his side of the field, right? Meaning if this point gets contested, he can easily develop reinforcements and recapture it. So this point is almost always his and this point is almost always ours. The point that all games are decided upon is the center point. Or the midpoint. This point, no, this is a neutral point, so nobody has prio on it. It's equally distant from my keyhole as it is from his, because the maps are kind of symmetri symmetrical. So the main way you win games is by maintaining long term control over the midpoint. And I'll show you how I did this in this game. So he goes second with the Murder Wing opening here, setting up control on this point. So if I want to contest this point, Murder Wing just kills Razor Mouth. All around, not bad. He captures his his panic point, pocket point actually with Bachula. Now we're neutral. I set up Unicorn here down the mid lane just to get control. And now I'm moving in Stabby for that extra ranged control in the mid lane. So notice how he moved Bachula here and did one attack on Unicorn. A lot of players, what they would have done was moved Bachula onto the midpoint. Because he doesn't do a lot of damage, so attacking with him is almost meaningless. But if he had done so, I would have been able to double attack and then move my Phoebe onto midpoint without using an action. You have to be very careful about positioning dimensional phobies onto points because the enemy can kill your dimensional phobie and then get moved onto that point and capture it automatically. So that's something you have to think about. So this was a proper play, but I still would not have attacked with Bachula if I was in his shoes. I would have just stayed back and watched as the game unfolds. Now he moves Eternal Knight behind Bachelor as kind of like extra support. So he's hoping that I'll kill Bachelor with Unicorn. It'll get pulled in and then it can get combo killed by one of these two, making a two key for one key trade, which would have been positive for him. Let's see how I go about this. So I move Stabby up and then I combo kill Bachelor without my units moving. And I open up a field here where my unicorn can kill his eternal knight. This is pretty much the game in a nutshell. That This is where the game ended, essentially. This combo kill here is how the game ended for my opponent. 
I got so much value out of this play that the game is practically over if I play everything else properly. So now the only way he can win from this game state is if I make mistakes. So I move Razormouth here, capturing midpoint. He's going to kill a Unicorn, I am aware of that, but he already served his purpose well enough. The reason he moves Murdering back and doesn't attack Razormouth again is because we can probably either do severe damage to Murderwing or kill it using a uh, Jar Cannon plus Razor Mouth plus something. So he moves back, tries to maintain like a more, more kind of defensive playstyle here. He is aware that he is kind of falling behind, so he is developing a trap phobia in hopes of kind of getting a field advantage with these traps. I am continuing to move my units down to the mid lane. I'm capturing his pocket point here, making sure I can trade Murderwing if he tries to kill Razormouth. So if he kills this, I just move Stabby up, move a lot of units up as well as my Murderwing, and then I can just trade this easily. So now we're looking at a good spot. We have all three points, meaning he has to force himself to do a bad play just to capture a point. This was his second mistake. What he should have done was just develop a stronger board, then pushed on. What he did is he immediately rushed onto my pocket point here to avoid taking damage, which was not necessary. The heart is still fairly healthy. He sh this is a mistake play, because look what ends up happening. Now, my opponent most likely thinks that I'm just going to continue this assault here or kind of continue to barricade this point and maintain control over this one. But since I know it's his pocket point, it's very hard to control. I'll just take the free trade up top here. This is a free four cost unit, which he just gave to me kind of like for no reason. It's free. So I'll just set up a wall here, a barricade, if you will, preventing him from <clears throat> from um, moving back. So this unit is dead. It's surrounded. It's gone. It's four keys thrown in the trash just to capture my pocket point, which can get easily recaptured by me. So now the reason I move Spud here instead of here and lob one shot at it is because I already know that this unit is dead. I don't need to commit more value into killing this. It's already dead. Omae wa shinderu. It's gone. So I'm moving my Spud here. And using him to maintain control over this point. Because if he moves Murderwing here, Spud rolls on over here, plus Jar Cannon, and it can kill his Murderwing. He goes Stabby onto the point, but it's his point anyway, so we don't care about that. He goes Snowball and kills my Razor Mouth, I believe, yes. And then he kind of runs away with Venus. Venus's worst brother, essentially. Okay, we recapture that point. And now we just corner that and kill it. Here we have a very good combo kill with Stabby onto Snowball and J Jar Cannon as well. When you have such good control over the mid lane, it makes your game a lot more flexible. Like, if I needed to, I could have used Murdering and moved it to help aid with the combo kill. But I didn't need it. That's, that's the beauty of having midpoint control. You have such flexibility as to what you want to do in the game. I move Stabby here. I think he goes for the kill on my Stabby. Yes, he does. Hmm, you forgot to attack with this. OK, 
Okay, I just get a free murder wing trade up here. Now I am aware he's gonna kill my spud. But that's a trade I was willing to make. We're just developing some phobies here to help close out the game. Little tip here, when you're closing out the game, try to develop um, undead phobies. Uh, Stat-wise, they're the best for closing out games. Because um, usually at the end game, your phobies are left in like a 2v2, 1v1 scenario. So having your units have 40% lifesteal is super huge in winning those 2v2s at the end or 3v3s or stuff like that. So always try to develop undead phobies when closing out a game. They're extremely powerful. Here we do get the kill onto um, Stabby. More undead phobies coming in. Baby Snake is just so good. And we're just closing out the game. There's nothing our opponent can do in this point of the game. It's just over, essentially. Yeah. These are just endgame trades here, closing out the game. There's nothing he can do. Even if he develops like a level 20 Jin Sting, it's still not enough. And yeah, I can skip the last few turns, you get you get the idea. He's just trying to defend, but he can't because I've just oh I just overwhelm him essentially. And that's it. That's the end of the game. Good game against Lost Stream. Had a lot of fun. Moving on, let's try to find a second game to analyze. Uh, we can go... Mm, I don't know, I don't really want the crashing wins. Uh, let's see. I th maybe this one was close. Let's check it out. Against Irvin. So, immediately... We go about analyzing the map again. The last map had three panic points. This map has one, two, three, four, five. Five panic points, so two more, meaning you're gonna be pushing a lot more heart damage to his heart, so it opens up a bigger chance to win the game by killing his heart instead of all of his phobies. The less points there are on the map means you're probably gonna have to kill all of his phobies to win the game. When there are more points, it usually means that if you develop enough phobies to get a map advantage, you can kill his heart without having to kill all of his phobies. It's as simple as that. So let's identify our pocket points. This is our pocket point here, because we can reach it in one turn with a flying unit. And um, it's in our corner of the map, so the opponent will never capture this point. Very rarely. If your opponent ever comes to capturing this point, you've probably lost the game already. Um, so this is our pocket point. This is his pocket point. Same thing, because the maps are symmetrical. Uh, this is a semi-pocket point here. We cannot reach it in one round, but it is on our side of the map. Percentage-wise, it falls onto our side of the map. So... This is kind of like semi our point. We have more prio on this point than he does. With this one, he has more prio. This is the same thing for him as well. He has more prio over this one. The only point that's not the same is the midpoint. So, we start off by developing two phobies. I always recommend developing either two or three phobies at the start of the game. Because it's a lot better than developing... One, it's a lot better because you get to set up um, double attacks, you get to set up point captures, stuff like that. I do see people start off with like a grave digger round one and stuff like that, but I would refrain from doing that. It's very rarely used on some maps to remove key obstacles, but most of the maps require you to just push mid with as many phobies as you can. So let's see how the game goes on. 
Irvin goes second. Uses his overpowered pigeon to set up uh, control over this point. Goes Razormouth here and waits. Waits for us to make the first move onto the point. That's exactly what we do. We move Contordio, capture midpoint, and develop Jinsting here. From this point, Jinsting has a lot of control on these points. Okay, he double attacks Contordio. Then we just trade Contordio with Jinsting. I'm assuming I did the following. Yep, okay. We trade Contordio for Razormouth. The reason I made that trade is because it was a one for one. So people might think, oh, you traded one key for one key. That means the trade is neutral. But what we got out of it as a bonus was control over the midpoint. Now he has to do very bad plays just to regain control over the midpoint. So that Contorio had a lot more value than people might think. We develop Razormouth here just to get more control over this point. Kind of enable the possibility of a combo kill. Okay. He attacks Jinsting, and then... So this is, this is the mistake the opponent made right here. This is the mistake. I hope you can notice it. When you're combo attacking in the early game, always look for an opportunity to kill an enemy phobie, to remove it from the game, essentially. What he did here is he weakened Jin, Jin Sting, and he weakened Razormouth. But both of them can now do double attacks. And these double attacks can lead to very devastating trades. So if he had killed Razormouth, for example, the game would have gone completely differently. Completely differently. I would have to double attack this with Jinsting, and then his Jinsting would double attack mine. Or this moves up and just kills it. It would have been so good for him if he had done that. But he didn't. Let's see what happens next. That was pretty much the deciding factor of the whole game. Him not killing Razormouth there. It sounds insane, but it, it's true. If he had killed Razormouth there, the game would have drastically went towards his favor. Now he attacks with Jinsting. Finally kills Razormouth. Jinsting still stays in a vulnerable position. Now look at this. I actually remember uh, calculating this damage on the calculator of my phone. So this is not a coincidence. I actually calculated this damage. Uh, so this is just so insanely good for us. Then he decided to do this. Let's watch what we do. We combo kill Baby Sneaky, and then we develop Plinico and heal our Jinsting back up. This is a huge value. A huge value play we just did. Okay. We're developing as many ranged uh, units as possible. As you can see, uh, you probably noticed that I have a, I have a thing for ranged units. <laughs> I, ex I prefer ranged units over melee units any day of the week because of the control they can set up. For example, this spud has control over both of these points. Both of them. No melee phobie can do that. Meaning, he is super valuable. Plus, he's flexible. We can do damage over walls with him.
He's doing the same thing here. The exact same thing. We move Spud there, going in for an insane assassination onto Jar Cannon here. We move Murdering, push some damage onto Ginseng, make sure we can kill him next turn, develop Clinico, and capture all the points. We did put our phobies in a vulnerable spot here, yes, but when it's a stalemate, when you have your phobies on one side and his phobies on the other, the person that makes the first move when you have the exact same setup on both sides, the person that makes the first move usually wins. Because we made the first move and immediately removed Jar Cannon from, from play. Bud dies. And he does the same clinical play here. See, so he's just mimicking me. Look what he has to do to mimic a fraction of my power. We continue healing up Jinsting. He's full at this point. I think we kill Murder Wing at this point. Yep. We get a free trade onto Murder Wing. If he wants to kill this, it's going to be very hard for him. Almost impossible, actually. Spud does not deal enough damage, and there's no way to actually... Develop a phobia that can kill us. So Jar Cannon is in a perfect spot here. We're developing Rocket Man just for for the memes, honestly, at this point. Um, okay, he's going up top. Gets my murder wing. Kind of sets up a little s squad here. But his heart has taken so much damage so far that um, we can actually go for the heart kill. This is what I said at the start of the game. When you have these this many panic points, usually the games end in a heart attack. We did have the ability to kill all of his phobies as well, but um, going for the heart attack is just more consistent and more... It's easier to do, essentially. That's one sus phobia. Anyway. Rocky Man just goes up and slaps the hell out of this. Uh, and it's over. And that would be the end of our second game. Let's go try to find a third game to finish this off. Let's see if we have one uh, that looks interesting. Um, hmm. Are there any high level opponents that I beat? Here we have this close win against Knight here. Let's see how this game plays out. Okay, you already know the thing about panic points. This map is very big, has a lot of panic points, and it's crucial to spread out your board to capture most of them in the early game and just maintain control over them throughout the game and just try to snowball from there. Let's see what I did here. Um, we capture two points because we're playing second. Um, I, I, I played Spud here. Because it's the only three cost I have that can offer like a bunch of range damage and that has enough movement to reach here. So um, I pretty much set up control over his midpoint very early on, like as soon as the game started. This spud plus this razor mouth prevents his unicorn from capturing this point without getting killed. Because usually how the game would have gone if I had not done this, if I had placed a melee unit here, he would have moved Unicorn here and attacked my unit. And if I didn't move a unit here, 
If I move it here, for example, he would have just placed a trap onto lava and then ended his turn. So this way we prevent midpoint capture without him having to sacrifice something. He makes a mistake here by sacrificing his one cost unit for no reason. Immediately off the bat he does that, because this is my pocket point. I can recapture this in one round. And it's in my corner so I can just combo kill this whenever I want to. Yep, we go spud. Into jar cannon. Now another play would have been keeping spud here keeping control over the midpoint. True, but then I would not have enough resources to kill his uh, sock assassin, and he would have been just able to move it out, out of danger. So we really want to kill this as soon as possible. He would have been out of danger even here. Even here. I mean, Spud would have been able to kill it in two attacks, but then Unicorn can just trade Spud with another key from the keyhole. And we go Razor Mouth here. Okay, okay. When your opponent has mid lane prio, like he did here, just develop a very strong unit that can tank a bunch of attacks onto the midpoint. They most likely will not be able to kill him in one turn. I always do that with Stabby. He's my icebreaker. Um, now we did let our opponent take midpoint control just to kill a sock assassin. That is true, but I really wanted to capture this point early on just to either push damage or stop him from pushing damage because I noticed that he also went for his pocket point. Uh, I really wanted to capture it, so that's why I did so with Razor Mouth. And I'm aware that we did give up control, but we can easily recapture it with the setup that we have. The reason he moved these back, even though they had direct control on this, is because he knows that they would not be able to trade Stabby. He's just too strong. Now we go Grave Digger. We remove this here because... We really want to enable like free movement here, because um, this map is a bit hectic when it comes to those landmarks. And I knew that the um, Razor Claw would take damage from the Venus, because he developed it first here, and then left it there. Instead of doing this, this, he just went it here, so that automatically means he threw a trap here. So I knew it would take damage, but I just didn't care. I really wanted the control. Okay, he developed Cerberus. This is a mistake by him, in my opinion. Uh, he should not have left Cerberus in Lava. Lava is a very... Kind of... Peop like, people don't recognize the amount of damage Lava deals. 225 does not seem like a lot. But you have to realize that this ticks at the end of each turn. Meaning, in a, your full turn rotation... You'll be doing 225 to your phobies times 2 because one turn you leave it in your pit and then when your opponent finishes his turn, it's still going to take your phobie again. So in reality, Lava does 450 damage just by standing there. Him leaving Cerberus in Lava, even though he's a tanky unit, still takes a bunch of damage from Lava. He already took 450 damage. I didn't have to do anything. What he should have done was left Cerberus here and then moved it two tiles onto here. It would have been at full HP.
another mistake, I believe, here. He's just butchering his own Cerberus here. For no reason. I think he should have captured this point and then moved from under here, pushing my phobies up to my keyhole and then ending the game like that. But he wanted to finish it through center. Which is not optimal when there's a lava pit there, so... Not sure what this whole play's about. Since I know I can't kill Cerberus in one round, I'll just kill the little units here that are causing a bit of, you know, distress around the map. And the reason I pulled Spud back is because Cerberus would have killed this in one hit and then killed Spud in one hit, making a very good trade for him. And we don't want that. That is a huge mistake by him. That is a huge mistake by him. So this this was potentially game losing for him. This play right here. Double attacking with Murdering means nothing here. What he should have done was double attack with Cerberus. Because he has 40% lifesteal on 1300 damage. So that's... It would have healed him back up more than the damage he would have received back from Stabby. So the thing he should have done here was attack Stabby. It gets pulled in. And then attack this. And then fly up, murdering, and kill my Gravedigger. That's what he should have done. And he would have won the game. It's that simple. Okay. You can notice how I put this um, Rocky Man here. The reason I did that be is because I know he wants to move Cerberus into the midpoint here. Meaning, from this position, Rocky Man could just approach him and then freeze him. Rocket Man and Cryostasis in general is super good against heavy hitters like Cerberus. It just disables him for two rounds. It's a very insane ability. Cerberus just becomes an overgrown punching bag for us at this point. Yeah, I moved I moved Jar down, then attacked. Not only to leave Creep some space to move, but also because I anticipated a trap positioning here. And um, I didn't want to lose my Jar, because Venus traps one-shot Jar. You always have to play around traps. Even last game I sh showed you, like, he also placed a bunch of traps. I just played around them, never got hit by them. Here, I did get hit. Like, Creep did get hit by a trap, but it doesn't matter too much. Now, this looks like a good trade for our opponent. In reality, it would have been a very good trade for my opponent. But the thing that happens here is the thing that happens here he did that trade but left his phobie very close to my keyhole meaning i can i can develop a phobie and then do a double attack there you go jane sting comes out with a double attack he's able to kill two phobies at once making a huge trade then I move creep down because his ability is on cooldown, so might as well just capture a point with him. Nothing better to do. We kill Cerberus. Not sure why he melted Cerberus. You should have anticipated us killing him. He was very low anyways. Snowball goes down here, kills Spud. We can still trade this. Now that was a mistake on my part. I should have attacked the Snowball with this, so it gets pulled into melee range with this, because this is a ranged unit. So it pulling, getting pulled into melee range would have been very good for us. 
there is a possibility of him having a frost trap here which you'll see later was the tr was the case but um it still would have been a better play if i had used him to kill the snowball So now what we're doing is these two are just going to duel him. I'm slowly going to capture points back so my heart doesn't die. And develop creep back so he kind of assists on this. I forgot about the trap there to be fair. That was a misplay on my part as well. I should have developed creep here. And then moved him here to poison this undead unit. But I did make a mistake there as well. Everyone can make a mistake. Now it's just an epic duel between um, Jinsting and um, what's its face? Don't know this card's name. Yeah, that's about it. The game's over. This uh, dimensional phobia, if he kills this, it just dies, and that's it. And that's the end of the game. So, yeah. Uh, I didn't plan on doing too many games. I think three games is enough. Uh, I'll do more if you request them. But so far, I just wanted to get this video out to let you guys know, like... I'm still active, I'm still gonna do Phobie's content, and um, like, share, subscribe if you haven't. And yeah, hope you learned something new. Peace out, guys.